Hi there, chapter 29 of Odd Thomas. When we left, um, Stormy and Odd had just finished talking to Terry, uh, Terry Stambaugh. Um, both Terry and Stormy are both really worried about Odd and it's f afraid of something happening to him throughout all this stuff with Fungus Man and all of that. So, anyway, let's, let's get started. Chapter 29. According to the big digital sign at the Bank of America, the temperature had fallen to a comparatively chilly 90 degrees here on the side of midnight when broomsticks are licensed to fly. A lazy breeze stirred through town, repeatedly dying and rising again, as though rust inhibited the mechanisms of the wind gods. Hot and dry, it traveled in crisp and fitful whispers among ficus's palms and jacarandas. The streets of Pico Mundo were quiet. When the breeze held its breath, I could hear the click of the switches in the traffic signal control boxes as the lights changed from green to yellow to red at the intersections. As we walked to Stormy's apartment, we remained alert, half expecting Bob Robertson to pop like a jack-in-the-box from behind a parked car or out of a doorway. Other than the wind-licked leaves, the only movement was the dart and swoop of a swarm of bats pursuing a flurry of moths through the glow of a street lamp to the moon and then out past Cassi Cassiopeia. Stormy lives three blocks from Pico Mundo Grill. We held hands and walked in silence. My course was set irrevocably. In spite of her objections, she knew as well as I did that I had no choice but to do whatever I could to help Chief Porter stop Robertson before he committed the slaughter that had drenched my dreams for three years. Anything that could be said on the subject now would be useless repetition, and here on the dark side of a threatening dawn, small talk had no charm. The old two-story Victorian house get, had been divided into four apartments. Stormy lives on the ground floor unit on the right. We didn't expect Robertson to be waiting there for us. Though he had somehow learned who I was, it didn't follow that he would easily discover Stormy's address. If he was lying in wait for me, my apartment over Rosalia Sanchez's garage was a better bet than Stormy's place. Prudence, however, made us cautious as we entered the foyer and then her apartment. Inside, the cool air had a faint peach scent. We left the Mojave far behind us when we closed the door. She has three rooms, a bath, and a kitchen. Switching on lights, we went directly to her bedroom, where she keeps her 9mm pistol. She ejected the magazine, checked it to be sure that it was fully loaded, and snapped it back into the weapon. I am wary of any gun, anywhere, anytime, except when it's in Stormy's hand. She could sit with her finger on the detonation button of a nuclear weapon, and I would feel safe enough to nap. A quick check of the windows revealed that they were locked as she had left them. No boogeyman had taken up residence in any of the closets. While Stormy brushed her teeth and changed for bed, I called Green Moon Lanes and listened to a recorded message regarding their hours, services, and prices. They open for business at 11 a.m. Thursday through Saturday, through Thursday through Sunday, and at 1 p.m. Monday through Wednesday. The earliest that Robertson could walk into the bowling center with murder in mind was when they unlocked the doors at 1 o'clock. Two multiplex cinemas with a total of 20 screens served the greater Pico Mundo area. By phone, I learned that the movie to which Viola had intended to take her daughters was playing at two theaters and only one multiplex. I made a mental note of the showtimes, the earliest of which was at 1.10 p.m. In the bedroom, I turned down the bedclothes, took off my shoes, and stretched out atop the thin blanket, waiting for Stormy. She has furnished her humble home with items from thrift, stop, thrift shops run by Goodwill and the Salvation Army. However, the look is neither shabby nor without character. She has a talent for eclectic design and for discerning the magic in objects that others might see as merely old or peculiar or even grotesque. Floor lamps featuring silk shades with beaded fringes, chairs in the stickly style paired with plump Victorian footstools upholstered in tapestries, Maxfield Parish prints, colorful carnival glass vases, and bibelots. The mix should not work, but it does. Her rooms are the most welcoming that I have ever seen. Time seems suspended in this place. In these rooms, I am at peace. I forget my worries. The problems of pancakes and poltergeists are lifted from me. Here, I cannot be harmed. Here, I know my destiny and am content with it. Here Stormy lives, and where she lives, I flourish. Above her bed, behind glass in a frame, 
is the card from the fortune telling machine. You are destined to be together forever. Four years ago on the midway of the county fair, a gaudy contrivance called Gypsy Mummy had waited in a shadowy back corner of an arcade tent filled with unusual games and macabre attractions. The machine had resembled an old-fashioned phone booth and had stood seven feet high. The lower three feet were entirely enclosed. The upper four feet featured glass on three sides. In the glass portion sat a dwarfish female figure attired in gypsy costume complete with garish jewelry and a colorful headscarf. Her gnarled, bony, withered hands rested on her thighs, and the green of her fingernails looked less like polish than like a mold. A plaque at her feet claimed that this was the mummified corpse of a gypsy dwarf. In 18th century Europe, she had been renowned for the accuracy of her prognostications and foretellings. The mottled skin of her face stretched tight over the skull. The eyelids were stitched shut with black thread, as were the lips. Most likely, this was not the art of death working in the medium of flesh as claimed, but instead the product of an artist who has been clever with plaster, paper, and latex. As Stormy and I arrived at Gypsy Mummy, another couple fed a quarter to the machine. The woman leaned toward a round grill in the glass and asked her question aloud. Gypsy Mummy, tell us, will Johnny and I have a long and happy marriage? The man, evidently Johnny, pushed the answer button, and a card slid out into a brass tray. He read it aloud. A cold wind blows, and each night seems to last a thousand years. Neither Johnny nor his bride-to-be regarded this as an answer to their question, so they tried again. He read the second card. The fool leaps from the cliff, but the winter lake below is frozen. The woman, believing the gypsy mummy had misheard the question, repeated it. Well, Johnny and I have a long and happy marriage. Johnny read the third card. The orchard of blighted trees produces poisonous fruit. And the fourth, a stone can provide no nourishment, nor will sand slake your thirst. With irrational persistence, the couple spent four more quarters in pursuit of an answer. They began bickering on receipt of the fifth car. By the time Johnny read number eight, the cold wind predicted by the first fortune was blowing at gale force between them. After Johnny and his love departed, Stormy and I took our turn with Gypsy Mummy. A single coin produced for us the assurance that we were destined to be together forever. When Stormy tells the story, she claims that after granting to us what the other couple had wanted, the mummified, the mummified dwarf winked. I didn't see this wink. I don't understand how a sewn shut eye could perform such a trick and yet fail to pop a single stitch. The image of a winking mummy resonates with me nonetheless. Now as I waited under the gypsy mummy's framed card, Stormy came to bed. She wore plain white cotton panties and a SpongeBob SquarePants t-shirt. All the models in the Victorian secret catalog in thongs and skimpy teddies and peekaboo bras collectively collectively possess a fraction of the erotic allure of Stormy in schoolgirl briefs and, SpongeBob, and a Spongebob top. Lying on her side, cuddling against me, she put her head upon my chest and listens to my heart. She got an earful. She often likes to be held in this way until she falls asleep. I am the boatman she trusts to throw her into her restful dreams. After a silence, she said, If you want me, I'm ready now. I am no saint. I have used my driver's license to trespass in homes to which I have not been invited. I answer violence with violence and never turn the other cheek. I have had enough impure thoughts to destroy the ozone layer. I have often spoken ill of my mother. Yet when Stormy offered herself to me, I thought of the orphan girl, then known to the world as Brownwen, alone and afraid at the age of seven adopted and given safe harbor only to discover that her new father wanted not a daughter but a sex toy. Her confusion, her fear, her humiliation, her shame were too easy for me to imagine. I thought also of Penny Callisto and the seashell that she had handed to me. From the glossy pink throat of that shell had come the voice of a monster speaking the language of demented lust. Though I didn't confuse my clean passion with Harlow Landerson's sick desire and savage selfishness, I could not purge from memory his rough breathing and bestial grunts. Saturday is almost here, I told Stormy. You've taught me the beauty of anticipation. What if Saturday never comes? We'll have this Saturday and thousands more, I assured her. I need you, she said. 
Is that something new? God, no. It's not new for me either. I held her. She listened to my heart. Her hair feathered like a raven's wing against her face, and my spirit soared. Soon she murmured to someone she seemed pleased to see in her sleep. The boatman had done his job, and Stormy drifted on dreams. I eased off the bed without waking her, drew the top sheet and thin blanket over her shoulders, and switched the bedside lamp to its lowest setting. She doesn't like to wake in darkness. After slipping into my shoes, I kissed her forehead and left her with the 9mm pistol on her nightstand. I turned out the lights elsewhere in the apartment, stepped onto the, into the public hall, and locked her door with a key she'd given me. The front door of the apartment house featured a large oval of leaded glass. The beveled edges of the mosaic pieces presented a fragmented and distorted view of the porch. I put one eye to a flat piece of glass to see things more clearly. An unmarked police van stood at the curb across the street. Law enforcement in Pico Mundo involves few clandestine operations. The police department owns only two unmarked units. The average citizen wouldn't recognize either vehicle. Because of the assistance that I've provided to the chief on numerous cases, I've ridden in and am familiar with both. Of the beige, ve- of the beige, beige vans identifying features, the stubby shortwave antenna spiking from the roof at the back was the clincher. I had not asked the chief to grant protection to Stormy. She would have been angry at the implication that she couldn't take care of herself. She has her pistol, her certificate of graduation from a self-defense course, and her pride. The danger to her, if any, would seem to exist only when I was with her. Bob Robertson had no beef with anyone but me. This chain of logic brought me to the realization that Chief Porter might be providing protection not to Stormy, but to me. More likely, it wasn't protection, but surveillance. Robertson had tracked me to Little Ozzy's place and had found me again later at St. Bart's. The chief might be keeping a watch on me in the hope that Robertson would sniff out my trail once more, whereupon he could be taken into custody for questioning about the vandalism at the church. I understood his thinking. Hang on one second. Sorry about that. I understood his thinking, but I resented being used as bait without first being asked politely if I minded having a hook in my ass. Besides, in the course of meeting the responsibilities of my supernatural gift, I sometimes resort to tactics frowned upon by the police. The chief knows this. Being subjected to police surveillance and protection would inhibit me, and if I acted in my usual impulsive fashion, would make Chief Porter's position even more difficult. Instead of leaving by the main entrance, I walked to the end of the public hall and departed by the back door. A small, moonlit yard led to a four-car garage and a gate beside the garage opened into an alleyway. The officer in the van thought that he was running surveillance on me, but now he served as Stormy's guardian, and she couldn't get angry with me because I had never asked that she be provided with protection. I was tired, but not ready to sleep. I went home anyway. Maybe Robertson would be waiting for me and would try to kill me. Maybe I would survive, subdue him, call the chief, and thereby put an end to this. I had high hopes of a violent encounter with a satisfactory conclusion. All right, that's it. Chapter 29.